Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at D2S with Aki Fujimura, who's going to talk today about using GPUs in semiconductor manufacturing. Aki, in the past when we looked at semiconductor manufacturing, typically you used a lot of CPUs instead of GPUs. What's changed? The big change that's going on right now is, one, is a lot of need for simulation-based processing, and then, two, is curved linear shapes that are uh, becoming prevalent in semiconductor manufacturing. So when you're dealing with curvilinear shapes, really what you're doing is saying, we don't need to do everything in a polygon. We can get these shapes much closer together than we could in the past and much more accurate too, right? Yeah, so curvilinear shapes give you a whole bunch of uh, additional freedom uh, as opposed to being constrained by Manhattan shapes or at, at most 45 degree shapes. and and uh, the additional freedom gives you uh, a lot of things that you could do that you couldn't do before. And uh, all of nature is, of course, naturally curvilinear. Uh, when you produce a mask or when you produce a wafer, uh, nothing is absolutely rectangular. There are no such thing as 90 degree corners um, anywhere in nature, right? So, um, uh, of course, uh, it's important to be able to be close to what the actual manufacturer's shapes are because closer you are to the manufacturable shapes, shapes that can be manufactured, closer you are to that in your design, more reliably it's going to end up being manufactured. So let's take a closer look. Sure. Aki, what does GPU actually bring to the table here? Yeah, so uh, GPU acceleration, uh, in our case using CUDA uh, as a programming language to take advantage of single instruction multiple data. And GPU acceleration is not just GPU, it's actually GPU coupled with CPU. So GPU is accelerating the CPU. Uh, GPU acceleration in the case of semiconductor manufacturing uh, gives you two really huge advantages. One is that GPUs, because it's a SIMD machine, single instruction, multiple data, is very good at manipulating pixels. And pixel data is different from expressing shapes as contours that are typically expressed by vertices and segments that connect them. The segments can be straight or they can be somewhat curvilinear or something, but nevertheless, vertices and segments. And when you have very complex shapes or curvilinear shapes, you end up with many, many vertices to be able to express them accurately enough. Whereas if you are um, in a known space of limited resolution, like 193i, like EUV, or even E-beam-based projection, when you know what the limit of resolution is, you know the pixels that you need, to, a pixel size that you need to express any shape that can eventually be written or that can be computed. So pixel-based computing is a different kind of computing as compared to vertex or uh, uh, segment-based computing. And the critical difference is just like multi-beam E-beam writing versus VSB, variable shape beam-based E-beam writing of the past, just like that difference. When you manipulate with pixels, there are no differences in runtime or accuracy of computing of curvilinear shapes or any curvilinear shapes versus Manhattan shapes, so long as the resolution limit is met. So curvilinear shapes, curvy shapes are enabled to be completely agnostic uh, to the vertex count because in pixel space, you have exactly the same number of pixels no matter what the shape is. It's just like how your TV screen works. So this is sort of like stepping on the gas as fast as you possibly can to get this job done because you need as, as many compute elements as you can possibly get in there, right? Yeah, so uh, NVIDIA GPUs in particular have been advanced, uh, advancing tremendously. Um, they just had the GPU Technology Conference of 2022, and uh, in that, uh, Jensen Wang announced uh, the new Hopper platform, and the advances in the number of cores that you can have uh, inside one GPU 
that it's just tremendous. There's uh, uh, three times <laughs> as many as the last generation prior in this one. So uh, it's like scaling more than Moore's Law. One of the criticisms of GPUs has been that it really is not the most energy efficient type of solution. Mm. You can develop chips that are much more customized. Why would you use GPUs here versus a customized uh, design? Yeah, so uh, in a semiconductor manufacturing market, uh, we really don't have any choice. Yeah, uh, it's always true that if you make a custom processor for your particular problem, um, uh, you can do a higher performing chip and you can uh, uh, produce something that's uh, less uh, power consum consumptive. Um, the Hopper chip, the H100, that was just announced, uh, one version of it is 700 watts per chip, and another version of it, the, ver the version that we would use, would be 350 watts. It's still a lot, right? Um, and, and you can do much better uh, uh, if you did a custom design, but uh, we can't afford it. Uh, uh, you know, custom designs uh, uh, take a lot of money. A, a general platform that can perform well and is tuned for our kind of processing, like simulation of nature, or simulation and manipulation of images. Well, these are the things the GPU is great at. So it's really perfect for us, yes. As you get into more curvilinear shapes, you're able to really tighten the spaces between the different elements because you're printing them much more accurately. What impact does that have in the design world where they're trying to say, oh, we, we now have uh, many more elements. You can now squeeze a lot more into a design than you could before. Yeah, so um, uh, the wafer shape density is controlled by how well lithography works. And so uh, uh, resolution enhancement technologies like inverse lithography technology or advanced version of optical proximity correction, OPC, and uh, that is what helps to make the shapes on wafer be denser. In turn, the most advanced form of IoT is curvilinear freeform IoT, where the shapes on mask, in order to produce the best wafer quality possible, are all curvilinear. So it's been known for 20 years that uh, uh, if you could manufacture mask shapes that are freeform curvilinear, if you could design and manufacture them, then that would produce the best wafer quality possible. That's been known for a long time. It just hasn't been practical to do that because mask writing machines were based on variable shape beam or VSP shapes and VSP shapes are shot one rectangle or a 45 degree triangle at a time, one at a time. And so it's uh, subject to how many vertices you have, how many edges you have. Curvilinear shapes are approximated by stair stepping and uh, each of those stair steps make one fractured rectangle, right? And those rectangles are shot one at a time in the VSP machine. So the write time of the mask writer was subject to how complex the shape was. That made it impractical uh, to try to use curvilinear shapes on the mask. That all changed in the last few years with the emergence of multi-beam based mask writing. Um, and with multi-beam mask writing, it works just like how your uh, TV works, or you know, like they they write in pixels, right? Just like how I, now GPU acceleration works for computing, right? For drawing something on the mask, it's write, writing using pixels, and because of that, it's completely agnostic to what the shape you're trying to write is, right? And that is the difference. That is the thing that enabled curvilinear shapes to be written on a mask, which has been known forever to be superior for wafer quality. And therefore, you can pack things tighter on the wafer than you would have been otherwise. Has the EDA world caught up to where you are in terms of being able to pack in that many more transistors in different shapes because now you're getting much more accurate in what you're, you're printing there? That's a good question. So um, uh, in terms of the design rules being able to be tighter because of curvilinear masks enabling wafers to be more dense, um, in terms of that, yes, it's just changing the design rules. 
but there is a huge opportunity uh, in addition to doing that, which is using curvilinear shapes on the design themselves, right? Instead of drawing squares for vias and contacts or rectangles, uh, uh, you would draw circles or ovals, right? Um, and uh, you can benefit from diagonal distance or, or, or whatever, right? Um, uh, instead of drawing only Manhattan shapes, you can draw uh, slightly diagonal or even curvilinear paths, right? Uh, Micron uh, specifically had done a talk uh, before about how they use diagonal jogs that are cascading to be able to do 64-bit buses more efficiently, right? If you need to do 64-bit bus jogs in rectilinear space, Manhattan space, they propagate in both the X and Y direction quite a bit. Whereas if you can do it using diagonals, it's quite a bit more space efficient. It's a very small example, but it's something that uh, will benefit in terms of space and, and uh, in terms of uh, power consumption, you talked about earlier, um, and also in the speed of the chip. The most important thing, I think, though, is the design to manufacturability uh, uh, consideration. So you can do better manufacturing aware design by designers designing shapes that are more manufacturable. More manufacturable shapes are more reliably manufacturable. Meaning, if you, make, if you try to make a 90 degree corner and you try to ask manufacturing to design that, manufacturing is not only not able to do that exactly, but it's not gonna be the same different every time. It's gonna be differently different every time, right? Uh, what really benefits both power and speed is reliability, manufacturing reliability. And that is enhanced when you design, you ask manufacturing to manufacture shapes that are actually more manufacturable. And that's the biggest difference, I think, in uh, using curvilinear designs. Does it also allow you to say, okay, we're, we're at five nanometers, do we necessarily have to move to three nanometers, or can we cram more into a five nanometer design? You can do both. Um, uh, of course, in order to advance to three nanometers, there are many benefits, uh, you know, power consumption among them, uh, uh, many benefits to going to three nanometer node, right? But in each of three nanometer or five nanometer or seven or even 28 nanometer, you can pack those shapes more densely and be manufacturable if you do, if you take advantage of these tricks. When did this become necessary and also when did this become uh, possible in order to do all this? So um, uh, necessary in many ways, uh, it's always been possible and it's always better to get more, but it's a trade-off against complexity, right? Um, you know, you have many different things that you could do in manufacturing to enhance manufacturability. There are many, many different techniques and it's always a trade-off which one is more practical, which one is here now, which one can be counted on, you know, all the time versus sometimes, you know, it, it takes hand-holding and, and uh, you know, different uh, different manufacturing lines are different, right? And um, if you're going to make one design many, many billions of times, that's a different kind of a consideration as opposed to you're trying to do many, many different designs. Some of them only need uh, 100 wafers, you know, right? So these are different trade-offs and different companies make different trade-offs according to what their situation is, right? Um, but uh, uh, it's uniformly true that every node can benefit from uh, a reliable resolution enhancement technology. As you get into curvilinear shapes, does it make it harder to inspect and also to do metrology? Uh, uh, yes, um, uh, uh, curvilinear design can lead to curvilinear manufacturing, curvilinear mask design. And when you have curvilinear mask designs, the metrology of the masks and inspection of the masks are affected. But today, already, the images that are taken of the physical mask are already curvilinear. And they take pictures. And pictures are all based on pixels, right? They are usually black and white pixels, right? Gray scale pixels. 
And because they're already in pixel space, just like um, when you talk about multi beam writing, or just when you talk about IoT and computing, um, or you talk about projecting something on a TV screen, just like that, um, images are being taken with pixels, not in vectors, right? So uh, the, these um, uh, images, image processing of uh, those pixels are resilient to any kind of a shape that's on it. Now, the issue comes when you need to compare that against the CAD shape that came in, right? But uh, there's a process called rasterization, where if you have a, uh, uh, a rectangle that you want to draw on your TV screen, it gets rasterized, right? And that uh, computing step is what takes care of the bridge between the, the, the two spaces. So going back to where we started here, is there something that you can do with a GPU that you couldn't do with a CPU and vice versa? Uh, so functionally, no, they are Turing equivalent, right? They can both do functionally the same thing. Performance-wise, or because of performance-wise, practically speaking, yes, a, a, a big difference. Um, I, I think um, it would be very difficult to find somebody trying to do deep learning training without a significant uh, GPU acceleration because GPUs uh, or SIMD machines, single instruction, multiple data machines, help so much when you're talking about training. Inferencing is a different thing. Inferencing is when you actually use the deep learning training result. Right? Um, inferencing can be done on many different kinds of platforms, and there are many startups that are doing specialized uh, uh, chips and stuff, right? And you can do it on CPUs or, or FPGAs. You know, there are many, many different uh, variations. But pretty much everybody does deep learning training on GPUs, right? So that tells you something. Right? And if you look at uh, recording studios and, and video processing or image processing, pretty much everything is GPU accelerated, or at least SIMD accelerated. Right? Uh, you look at all the video games and all the video game machines, while they might not have a gener generic GPU uh, on it, uh, they, they have basically a single instruction multiple data GPU architecture inside of their specialized chip. So, so, so it's pretty clear by just evidence that the world has figured out that uh, GPUs are good at these kind of things. The, the biggest supercomputers in the world are doing things like uh, massive simulation for weather forecasting, right? And those are GPU accelerated too, because GPUs are just naturally good at things that are natural. Um, Right? Uh, nature doesn't have, you know, air molecules don't have individual uh, brains, you know, in them, right? They behave differently depending on their environment. Maybe the temperature, maybe humidity, or, you know, uh, what else is around them, the wind, or, you know, atmospheric pressure, or uh, there are many different factors, but they're all different data. They're not being controlled individually by a different thinking machine, right? You know? And so nature works exactly like that. And because of that, SIMD, single instruction multiple data, like GPU, is an incredible device for things that are trying to process or mimic um, uh, actual processes in nature. Aki Fujimoro, thanks for a great explanation. Okay, thank you, Ed.